The Supreme Court puts gay marriage in Ohio's hands. From the Battelle studio at WOSU at COSI, this is Columbus on the Record. Joining Mike Thompson this week, Kathy Kandiski, State House reporter for the Columbus Dispatch. Ron Bryant, news director for Bounce 23 TV. Gene Krebs, former state legislator. And Brian Rothenberg, director of Progress Ohio. The Supreme Court basically had three options when it came to gay marriage. Keep things as they were. Keep DOMA, the federal law that does not recognize gay marriage. It could have overturned DOMA and thrown out all of the state bans on gay marriage. Or the third option was split the difference, end DOMA, but let the states decide gay marriage. That's the path the court took. It ruled the Defense of Marriage Act unconstitutional, which gives federal recognition to gay marriage and extends federal benefits to gay couples. But the court will let states, like Ohio, decide if they want to allow gay marriage. The ruling guarantees the controversy will play out in Ohio over the next few years. Brian Rothenberg, the ruling does not directly impact Ohio like it does California and the federal government, but what impact will it have here? It, well, it does have some impacts already. I mean, already you're seeing things like the HHS has lifted a ban on, um, um, as a family member, a gay spouse can now go into a nursing home if it's a Medicaid facility. Uh, you saw it was no longer part of the debate over immigration this week. Um, it will have an effect. Um, because the language in that decision is pretty sweeping. And so if there is a challenge of a state law at some point, it could open the, f open the floodgates for all the different states. But for right now, the destiny is in the hands of each state. And I think it's only a matter of time in Ohio. There is Freedom Ohio, which is, is planning on moving, uh, they say, in 2014. All the other um, coalition groups are talking about either 2014 or 2015. You're going to see it, and I think it's sort of a march to where the public is. I think the biggest, the biggest impact on that ruling here in Ohio is the momentum that it helps build for a ballot issue down the road, whether it's next year or the year after that. I think it's just a matter of time. Momentum's really building. I think that got supporters who already seem to be enjoying a, a little bit of momentum already just that much more for their cause. Which comes first, though, a ballot question asking voters to overturn the 2004 amendment that bans gay marriage, or a court challenge, which could use the Supreme Court ruling to overturn the ban? Well, I think both could happen, um, you know, yeah. and it could be yeah. going on simultaneously. But, but that language in the DOMA decision was pretty sweeping, and I think if, if the right opportunity and facts arise, I think it could wind up in court. But I would urge them to do, if they want to do this, do a multi-missile approach, but I think 2014 is going to be a very difficult year for all liberal issues, candidates, everything like that, just because of the massive demographic swings you see in these type of election cycles. I believe that it could also uh, begin with a, a court ruling or some some you know juxtaposition uh, there. But you know, understanding theocratic order personally, um, I'm for uh, a man and a woman uh, in terms of being married, and you know that's that's just the way it should be. So, I mean, so you're disappointed in the, the Supreme Court's decision, and, and they should be allowed to define marriage legally. What's well, I, I believe that you know the the situation is is a moral issue. And morally, uh, if, if we're going to be on the right side of morality, a man and a woman need to be uh, engaged in, in marriage. Um, does it matter when it goes? I mean, Gene mentioned that 2014 could be tough for Democrats. If We'll get to John Kasich's approval rating in a moment. But um, <coughs> is, is it better, Brian, to go to 2015, 2016 for this? You know, I, I think that there are different people that have different opinions on it. I think that. Um, uh, it could be that you have both. I mean, you have two different groups that are going in two different directions, and there might be one in 2014 and one in 2016, and some people think that that's, you know, a waste of resources or time, but I gotta tell you something. If the energy is there, it'll pass. And um, as we saw with many other issues like casinos and other things, you can put a bunch of stuff on the, uh, of issues on the ballot, and when it's time comes, it will pass. But timing, timing is important with these ballot issues, and 2014 will be a gubernatorial election year. Kasich is, you know, on the ballot, pretty popular. It may be tougher that year 
than it would be the year after that. However, but you have to balance that, like you mentioned, Brian, with there's a lot of momentum right now. People are eager to jump on this. And you have but to understand that it is an economic situation, too. Um, the gay community brings a lot of economics to the table, and as a voting block, you've got to, you know, definitely allow them to represent. I'll make two That's predictions. One is, is that the uh, pro-gay universe will make the ballot language too complicated, and two, that if it's in 14, it will not necessarily succeed, even though a lot of people think it may, just because that is going to be, by, by the structure, an overwhelmingly conservative year. And I would time. advise them not to do it then. If you're a polling company, it's a good time <laughs> to kind of get your card out there. That's true. It's a target-rich <laughs> environment here <laughs> in Ohio. Although <Although, laughs> on complicated language after redistricting, I think everybody's got their eye on simplifying language. I keep telling this to your side. They keep going, yes, we know, and then you come up with 4,000 pages. <laughs> um, I don't know if the Republicans are known for... Will Ohio have to change some of its administrative rules? I mean, one in particular is our tax returns in Ohio, the state tax returns, say that however you classify your marital status on the federal return is how you have to classify it on the state return. Well, one would hope that the governor is, uh, uh, you know, some of this is under executive purview, that we're not going to have a culture war over this and that those things that apply to the federal law will be implemented at the state level. Can I ask you, are, are you new here? <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to have a culture war over this. Uh, well, you know, over everything. I, I, I do hope that, you know, some of the culture wars yeah. sort of died down here. Yeah. On some there, of there's, there's another thing, that, there's another lawsuit relation to this, which is the California decision, which I think has implications for your Jobs Ohio suit, which was California, the lo lawsuit was brought up and sent back by the Supremes because they said that unless you are part of that legal structure, you do not have legal standing. Well, the only difference there, Gene, is that in this case, the state wouldn't defend the state, and so an outside group came in to defend the state. My group isn't defending the state on this. My group is actually challenging the state over an unconstitutional And I'm provision. careful about not practicing law without a license, <coughs> somewhat. <laughs> but I think I think your road to hoe just became a lot harder. Um, it, it shouldn't have any effect. That's the uh, Jobs Ohio is challenging, I mean, uh, Progress Ohio and the Tea Party groups are challenging Jobs Ohio. And the Case Administration of Jobs Ohio is saying that jobs, Progress Ohio does not have standing. We're getting into really deep, deep legal weeds here. Um, the other, the other thing that's come up is if you were, obviously you cannot get married in Ohio if you are gay, legally married, but you can get married in Massachusetts. You can get married in Iowa and then move here. Should Ohio have to recognize? Well, I think if states don't recognize marriages. it, I mean, I think, Mike, this is the problem that's going to lead to some of the legal decisions mm -hmm. that the Ohio Constitution to. does not recognize. Yeah, so. well, I mean, you know, because if you're married and you have these marital, uh, a legal marriage, um, why doesn't carry over state lines? So I think that these are some of the issues that are, could wind up in court. But my advice to the conservatives on this is right now Columbus is having the national fencing championships go on up at the convention center. And being a former intercollegiate fencing coach, I'm going to tell everybody there's times to attack and there's times to parry. And there may be, this may be a time to, from the right to go ahead and parry and repost and not necessarily go on the attack. So you were getting old stuck on you before you got into oh, politics? absolutely. <laughs> All right. Absolutely. <laughs> Let's, get to, Let's get to topic number two. Ohio taxpayers will see lower and sometimes higher taxes as a result of the state budget, which passed this week. The income tax is going down by roughly 10% over the next few years. Taxes on small businesses, very small businesses, are cut in half. The sales tax is going up slightly, a quarter of one cent. And the state no longer will subsidize school levy increases, which means less money for schools or higher levies. And fewer people would be eligible for the homestead exemption. What's not in the budget are the things that John Kasich wanted. A deeper income tax cut, a deeper small business tax cut, an expansion of the sales tax, a new tax on fracking drillers, and the expansion of Medicaid. None of that is in this budget. So Kathy Kandiski, whose budget is this, the governor's? or the legislatures? Well, I, I think clearly it's the governor's budget. I think probably you need to go no further than it's a $2.7 billion tax cut for in a, in a budget for a governor who's going into a, a re-election campaign next year. I think it's a win for him. Um, you're right, there's some things that he didn't get. Some um, things? A lot of things. There are a lot of things he didn't get, but, but on par, I mean, a tax cut's a tax cut. You know, um, I think that that helps them a lot. Medicaid expansion, um, 
you know, that's something he's pushed for. He couldn't get through. I think it's been pretty well publicized out there that he is a strong advocate for it. Not sure if it hurts him, even if that doesn't go through. But, but the big thing for him is, you know, uh, Ohio's coming out of the recession. Uh, we've, there's more jobs. The bud, you know, there's no budget deficit. There's been two, you know, tax cuts under his watch. I think there's no question it's a good budget for this governor, especially going into an election campaign. You, you know, uh, what's amazing is that you hear the Republicans talking about this as being all tax cuts, but you know, the last budget was 56 billion dollars. This one is 62 billion dollars. So there's more money here. So where did it go? Well, let me tell you. The, the, the cuts went to wealthier people when it came to the corporate tax cut or the income tax cut. But what they're not talking about is the fact that on the local property tax level, they took away the match of the state that was paying a portion of that. That's raising your property tax. They raised the overall sales tax for everybody instead of getting rid of loopholes. I mean, there is more revenue, but it's us paying and certain people getting the benefits more than others. There's an exhibit right now at Close Eye where this is being filmed called Mythbusters. And so I have to respond here. A, it's not going to increase anybody's taxes. 12.5% rollback right now is the statute. What's magical about 12.5%? Why isn't it 100%? If no I'm not paying it now and I'm paying it then, it's um, more taxes. No, I'm it's not. No, it's not. It's because of how the state pays for that extra 12.5%. The other thing to remember here is that, you know, I'll just talk about local governments. The state is now employing the, le the least number of people in the past 30 years that's ever employed, and the state budget essentially is a pass-through mechanism. Okay, 85% of the state budget goes and gets passed through to other entities. When I left the General Assembly in 2000, it was 81%. In other words, what I'm saying is that most of the money comes into the state and is distributed at a rate of about $4,500 per person on average. But the, Jane, this is, it, it's only a one quarter of 1% increase in the sales tax. Right. But that's a 10% increase in the sales tax. Right. Overall, I mean, right. that, that's a 10% jump in taxes. If you put it that way, it seems like quite a lot of money. Not when you combine it with all the other tax. Exactly. Not, not you combine it, though, yeah. with all the other tax cuts going on. It's a net tax. And this is the thing, if you're going to reform, and this is the thing I have to give this, and I'm critical of this administration on many things, but this administration at least is trying to reform things, things that should have been reformed for the past quarter century. But Gene, if, if, if I'm uh, the whole package, if I'm at the top 1%, I get about $6,000 back in analysis just recently came by. And if I'm in the poorest 20%, I get $12. And the average person gets about 60. Okay, here's another thing. The top 1% pays 42% of the income tax. Of that, 40, of that tax that they pay, two thirds of it comes from capital gains and dividends. It's ephemeral, which is why states like Ohio and California, when times are good, Times are extraordinarily good for us, but when times go bad, things are extraordinarily bad for us. We need to start moving away from a highly progressive, sorry, income tax structure to one that's more flattened and less dependence on it because that leads to high volatility. If you want to fund- well, Ron Bryant, the governor wanted even more reform than he got. I mean, he wanted a right. half a percent increase in the, in the sales tax, but he wanted the sales tax to dog groomers, to lawyers, to PR professionals, yeah, all across the to board. laundromats, yeah. that didn't go anywhere. Did he not fight hard enough for that reform? I think he's fighting, but again, like you said, not hard enough. But the bottom line is, it's the governor's tax. Uh, it's the governor's budget. And I believe that uh, he's going to have to get some push on the Medicaid side as well. That's going to be very, very important for my community. Does the budget at all, Kathy, does the, the balance of the budget rely any, in any way on the Medicaid expansion money that we would have, Ohio would have gotten from well, the feds? Well, according to the administration, Medicaid expansion would have saved the state, I think, $400 million. Legislative leaders say that it's not a hole, that it's not a hole they have to fill. How they get those numbers to marry up, I, I have no idea. No one knows. Who yeah. knows? Yeah. But they say, they say not, so. But it could come back as early as September. Not expansion of Medicaid, but a reform well, of the Medicaid, speaker right? Today actually the speaker said today said happen. there will be a vote on that before the end of the year. But, you know, the speaker is very careful not to say expansion. So what exactly will be voting on by the end of the year? Again, who knows? Expansion. And a, and <laughs> if an expansion comes to a vote, most people feel that it would pass because you'd get the Democrats and the moderate Republicans to, to Well, I guess what's so maddening for the supporters of this is 
and kind of why folks are questioning the speaker's motives or sincerity on the issue is there already is, by accounts on both sides, a majority of lawmakers that support Medicaid expansion and separate legislation, which they have. But for some reason, it's not coming up to a vote quite yet, so it seems like it's being delayed by leadership. Okay. Based on the polls, you would think that John Kasich would be able to get anything he wants at the State House. The latest Quinnipiac University poll gives the governor his highest approval rating yet in his term. Let's go way back to March of 2011. That's when Senate, the Senate Bill 5 defeat was still fresh. Only 30% of Ohioans approved of John Kasich's performance. Now look at his approval rating. It stands at 54%. That's a full 22% jump in the governor's approval rating. Gene Krebs, not a bad position to be at a year or so away from re-election? 16 months, but who's counting? And Is he um, peaking too soon? <laughs> no, I don't think so. He's just below that mythical 50%, 50 you know, would you re-elect him? Um, I think this goes to the issue, and you've heard me say this for some time, 14 is going to be uh, demographically just a bad year. It's, it's the last midterm of the incumbent president's term. Those are always harsh. The key is for the Democrats is can they somehow regain their ability to control the message? Right now they do not control the messaging or the framing. That's being controlled by everybody else. And I think the challenge for them is can they go ahead and do that? If they, if they can't figure out how to do that, or if the Republicans, like in 98, do not hand it to them by over-response with the impeachment process, if that has not happened, I foresee a very easy walk for everybody. I mean, you know, this time in the last election, everybody thought John, K John Kasich had no chance to win. Um, a year and a half, I said it when he, when, when he was down in the polls, a year and a half is a lifetime in politics. Um, in terms of messaging, it's really not about him. If you look at his favorability rating, it hasn't really shifted. His his uh, rating on his job approval has shifted, but his rating on his favorability hasn't. I think that has more to do with the economy, and there have been a lot of bad stories about the economy actually slowing down in Ohio and some problems in Ohio in recent months. And so the polling tends to follow it. One other caution, the Cook Political Report just this week had Barack Obama at his lowest point ever. And w three days later, they did another poll, and he's three points up. It's a really right. volatile polling time. Let's, let's right. look at the president's approval rating here in Ohio. The same poll out this week by Quinnipiac University. Let's go back in time again to right after the president was inaugurated. This isn't, you know, we cannot, he could not keep it at 67%. It was February of 2009. But right now, he is way down to 40% approval, 57% disapprove of the job the president is doing. Kathy Kandiski, how much of an impact does the IRS scandal, the, the tapping news organizations, the all that stuff surveillance is, issues? All, all, all those things are really, are really weighing him down right now. And, and the governor, on the other hand, is really benefiting from the economic conditions in Ohio improving. Unemployment's down. They talk a lot about new job creation and private sector job creation. All that's helping. All those things helped. President Obama in the last election, but then these things you mentioned, the IRS, all these negatives, they're just kind of piling on top of him right now. Kasich's looking pretty good right now, but the Democratic engine is an idol. And when you're idling, you know, you have an opportunity to ramp it up a little bit. And ultimately, I believe in the midterm, we're going to see that ramp up. Idling is a word. Three out of, the, three out of four people asked about Ed Fitzgerald didn't know enough about him to give an opinion. Is, is it 25 percent? known factor too low at this point? No, I mean, Ted Strickland, when he ran, John Kasich, when he ran outside of Central Ohio, it, it was the same way. And I, I remember when I did the 2002 campaigns with Tim Hagan, who was known in Cuyahoga County and nowhere else, that the early <laughs> polls had him mm -hmm. with no name recognition. He never went on TV, and he was at 90% name recognition by the end. It's right. Ohio. It's early. Yeah, it's, it's early. early. Well, it's not early for Rob Portman. 30% of, of the respondents don't know enough about Rob Portman. He's been in office for almost four years now. Yeah, which, and I know, and the late Tom Moyers never got above 11% on the Supreme well, Court. The Supreme Court's different yeah. than the U.S. Senate, though. Uh, going, going, going to Brian's point, um, th you're right. And right now, nobody knows Fitzgerald. Uh, I think that, I think his running, and by the way, you look around to see um, p politicians like Betty Sutton chose specifically not to get into this because they knew it could be a bad year. He's, and part of his other problem is he's very much engaged about reform up in Cuyahoga County. 
this governor is ba engaged very much in reform. Now, you may not like where he takes all the reform, but in talking to Bobby and Betty Buckeye, what I've heard from them is they like the, ref they like the idea of this reform going on. Fitzgerald's going to have a hard time defining the difference, I think, between himself and Kasich on the reform issues, too. And right now, that's what it is. Fitzgerald this is just a little too far out. Uh, I believe that maybe by the top of the year, we'll have another person, uh, don't want to say who, but another person in into the fray and into the mix and, uh, you know, making a bat and trying to knock it out the park. From the far right? Someone or for some of the Democrat. On the right, Democratic right. side, yeah, Democratic far side. right, yeah. Okay. yeah. Let's get to our last topic. The Columbus City Schools has a new leader, albeit a temporary one. The Columbus School Board this week hired J. Daniel Good to be the district's interim superintendent. He previously served as superintendent of Westerville City Schools and the Worcester School District. He replaces Gene Harris, who is leaving amid an investigation over data rigging. Good's first job helped convince voters pay for higher school property taxes in November. Ron Bryant, <laughs> higher, I want you to pay higher taxes while the state investigation is about to hit the yeah, news. Yeah, that's going to be a rough one. He <laughs> didn't even have a chance to get out of the frying pan. He was just thrust right into the fire. So, you know, we're, we're going to have to take a look and see what's going to Going to go, going to go, go, going to go down. We're going to have to take a look and see what the mayor's education commission is going to come up with and their recommendations. We're going to have to take a look at uh, what uh, the the school board is is going to uh, say, and we're going to have to really take a look and see what Mayor Coleman is you going mean to as do. Far in as the size of the levy that. and what absolutely not, because they've, they've made recommendations on the on the auditor and on sharing the levy with uh, with charter schools, and that's all been put in place. Awaiting the governor's right, signature. right, and on the other side, of course, we're going to have to talk about that uh, in 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 ways in which it's going to be productive for the community and for the school system. The, the mayor and the business leaders likely will behind will be behind the levy. Is that enough to they ha they overcome? They have to be. I mean, I kind of compare what's going on in Columbus now to what we saw in Cleveland last year. We had the Cleveland mayor take the lead there. Now, this isn't the same no, in terms of the power of Mayor Coleman here in Columbus, but you saw the Cleveland mayor take control, get the business community behind him, and kind of very clearly set a new path. And I think it led to a levy succeeding in that district after those reforms were put in place. I think what you're seeing here is, is the mayor not as direct of a role as uh, in Cleveland, but uh, the mayor taking a little more of an active role, uh, the community, business community getting behind it. But there's not a lot of time to sell voters on, you know, the changes and convince them that, you know, the district's on a new Especially path. under the circumstances. Yes. And another question is, will the governor weigh in? Because I think that this, in Cleveland, he weighed in and came out in favor of it. Yes. And this is, this, is, this is a city where 90% of the people will never vote for him under any circumstance. Okay, yet he chose to use up political chits and expose himself politically to do what was the right and statesmanlike thing. The question is, is that can that happen here? If it does happen here, will it have an impact? Well, do you think Kasich helps a Columbus school levy or hurts a Columbus school levy? That's the same question up in Cleveland. No, it may have helped. <laughs> Timing is a factor here because Dave Yost, the state auditor, is still doing his investigation of the, of the rigging. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a federal investigation going on. It's July. They want this thing on the ballot in November. He's going to have to live up to his name in more than one way. I mean, good is the right name for this guy's job. They're going to have to really yeah. show. He's going to really changes. have to show. But will there be enough time to show that they're going to have reforms in place for when the investigation comes out that lays out what went wrong? You know, I, I think that if uh, if they put together the right kind of campaign. And if, if, if people can buy into it, I mean, there are some controversial things for, for all sides here, including the charter school piece. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but if they can bring together a coalition that can really sell it, yes, you can succeed. Coalition. But it's a short key. time. Mm -hmm. Coalition is the key, especially when you don't have sort of an interim leader. But it's November. But it is an off-year election, so you're not going to have the same turnout you would in 2014. Right. So you can, that it generally helps a school cool. levy. Yeah, that yeah. is true. The yeah. lower, the fewer the number of voters, the more teachers and their friends and, right. and school supporters. And teachers union. And teachers unions. That's it's why it's going to be a heavy lift. It's going to be a heavy lift. Yeah. And the levy, does the sharing the money with the levy help the school levy or hurt the school levy in Columbus? By law, they have to share levy money with, le with charter schools. Yeah. I got to see the formula to let you know. And you, basically, it's just like what we say in General Assembly. I got to see what we call the runs. I got to see how each school district is going to get how much money, and then the voting follows from that. So when we see that published here, 
probably in a month or so. Yeah. That will determine. All right, let's get to our final off-the-record parting shots. Brian Rutherford, you're up first. Cavs surprised the world with their first pick, but their second pick is going to start start this year. The the guy from Russia. So okay. a Canadian and a Russian, right? Canadian and a Russian. Wow. Yeah. The world is flat. <laughs> yep. Gene. There are many reasons to vote yes on a state budget, many reasons to vote no. Everybody who voted no then has to face the fact they voted no on an income tax cut. The other thing, though, there's a small little hidden thing in there that's going to change your utility rates that could be very mischievous and make them really skyrocket. Nobody knows about it, and it's not been reported on very much yet. Well, why, didn't, why are you just spilling it now? <laughs> I've told him. <laughs> <it. laughs> right. that, that's what we call it in the business, a tease. Uh, uh, run. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but, uh, <laughs> well, you know uh, how that goes. Free speech is high finance, and when you run your mouth and when you talk, uh, it sometimes can come back to hurt you, and uh, we're seeing this now with the Paula Dean case, but so we've got to be very careful in this sensitive time of uh, political, uh, political expediency and uh, got to watch it. All right, Kathy. Well, uh, you know, I don't cover the legislature all the time, but I was in there this week and just was flabbergasted to hear the debate about removing red light cameras from Ohio roads. And it looks like that, that bill passed the House and it looks like there's nothing preventing it from passing the Senate. So it won't be long before you're not going to have to worry about those pesky cameras. You wow. can run through all the red lights you want. Oh, goodness. Uh, <laughs> next week, a special Columbus on the record. We interview former Governors Strickland and Taft. Very interesting discussion, but the most interesting discussion came after the cameras had stopped rolling, of course, when they both were recalling fond memories of sleeping at the state fair. The, the cool breezes that came through the barns, the soft smells of the animals. Soft. <laughs> All the more reason why Governor Kasich should renew the tradition and sleep at the State Fair. <laughs> That's close on the record for this week. Check us out online. Thanks to our panel and our crew. I'm Mike Thompson. Have a good week. <laughs>